because I, I have no idea how we're gonna how we're going to do this. Um, so let's pick up. Let's finish the letters of Saint Ignatius today. Um, and if I remember correctly, we got through the Trallians, correct? Somebody please say yes. Uh, we have Romans on what to do. Romans and what follows Romans. Yeah. Romans, Philadelphians, yeah. Smyrnans, and to the letter to Polygon. Okay. That's what I thought. All right. To the Romans. <clears throat> Nicholas is not here, correct? He's the fifth. Okay, so um, to the Romans, in the first paragraph, <clears throat> Saint Ignatius writes. Greetings in Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, from Ignatius, the God-inspired. Notice, you know, he uses that tag in every letter. The God-inspired or the God-bearer, Theophorus. To the church that is in charge of affairs in Roman quarters, and that's an awkward phrase. It's not really understood what is meant by that. And that the Most High Father in Jesus Christ, his only Son, have magnificently embraced in mercy and love. That is, the Father and the Son have embraced the church in Rome in mercy and love. You... I'm sorry, when you say this, we're not sure what's meant by the, that. That is in charge of affairs in Roman quarters. Um, Richardson has this long note where he says, Bizarre as some of Ignatius's expressions are, this one is most perplexing and has exercised commentators not a little, meaning a lot. Uh, and he gives the Greek and then says, the words in topo might conceivably be taken as indignity, and the whole clause rendered, which has a precedence of dignity over the district of the Romans, that is, to the church that has the precedence of dignity over the district of the Romans. Another suggestion has been to read Christu for Coriu, which presides over the district of the Romans in the place of Christ. The most usual reading rendering, excuse me, has been, which presides or has the chief seat in the district of the region of the Romans. This is somewhat barbarous. It also presents an ambiguity. Is the presidents, that is, this seat of exaltation, if you want, um, exercised over the whole church or only over the district in which the Roman church has its seat? My own rendering is modeled on the phrase hotopos tescoros, which means the local circumstances of the district. If, then, the Greek text is correct and topos has the sense of Local circumstances, this is why I tried to just gloss over it. Yeah, the, uh, the expression literally rendered would be, which has the chief seat in the local circumstances of the district of the Romans. To, so to put all that back together would be, if you followed his literal rendering, to the church which has the chief seat in the local circumstances of the district of the Romans. So, you could take that or the church that's in charge of affairs in Roman quarters. Again, it's not clear what's meant by church. Is he talking about a little local house church right. or the church universal, as it were, in Rome? Right. Not the church universal, universally. Okay. <clears throat> so, he goes on. You have been granted light both by the will of him who willed all that is, and by virtue of your believing in Jesus Christ our God, and of loving him. Notice the distinction there between the light that's been granted, first, by, first by God. <laughs> it's been just one of those. I was speaking to a men's group in, Nash, in not Nashville, Franklin last night, and then ended up speaking with questions and answers for about, Two and a half hours and didn't get home till one o'clock. So I'm, my brain's kind of fried after that. Um, you've been granted light both by the will of him who willed all that is, God, and what? 
by virtue of your believing in Jesus Christ. Notice, it's belief in Christ that grants illumination. Right? The belief enlightens. It adds to knowledge, if you want, or light that has already also been given by God. By believing in Jesus Christ and loving him. Okay, so there's, there's two aspects to that. Notice, believing, that's an act of the will. Loving is also an act of the will. Believing is an act, however, of the will combined with the mind. Loving isn't necessarily an act of the mind. Loving is an act of the, of the whole soul, the whole person. Okay? Um, so he goes on and he tells them about how wonderful they are and how they rank first in love, blah, 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 blah. I'm going to skip Quite a bit in this one. Well, quite a bit in the beginning of this one. He goes on in the next, um, I guess we'll call it chapter still, and says, since God has answered my prayer to see you godly people, well, how has God answered his prayer? Yeah, because, you know, he wants to, as he said in the previous letters, be a Christian. And how does one be a Christian? Die. To die for Christ. So he says, I've gone on to ask for more. God's granted me my wish. I wanted to see you. Now I get more. I mean, it is as a prisoner for Christ Jesus that I hope to greet you. If indeed it be God's will that I should deserve to meet my end. Okay? If it's God's will that when he says I should deserve to meet my end. What does he mean by that deserve? It means that he is sort of a reward. If it be God's will that I am worthy to meet my end, worthy to meet his end, hell, martyrdom. If he is worthy enough to be counted among the martyrs, things are off to a good start. You know, he's been arrested. He's chained to his ten leopards, as he calls them. Things are going great. He's being beaten daily. You know, way to go, God. Things are off to a good start. May I have the good fortune to meet my fate without interference. And that's the first indication he gives to, to this particular church of don't mess things up. Okay? Don't beg for my freedom. What I fear is your generosity which may prove de detrimental to me. Because their generosity, what does he mean by that? Their generosity to directly to Ignatius? No. How can their generosity prove detrimental to him? Buy him off. To buy off the guards. Happened all the time. Okay? I mean, what happens when, um, after the resurrection of Christ, you know, when word comes back to Pilate and they find out the body's gone, you know, it's like, uh, you know, the guards did it. It's The guards are responsible. So, he goes on, for you can easily do what you want to, whereas it is hard for me to get to God unless you let me alone. Now, why is it easy for them to do what they want to? The church in Rome is powerful. That is, the church in Rome is not, at the time that St. Ignatius is writing, and earlier when Paul was writing, the church in Rome is not... Um, made up entirely of people of no account. Let me put it that way. There are the proverbial movers and shakers that are part of that church. So he says, you can do an awful lot, begging them not to. But he says, I can't. The only way he can get to God, he thinks, is through martyrdom. And notice, as, as we talked about the other day, this is not Ignatius saying, Everybody has to follow this path. He's saying, this is what I have to do. This is the cross he must bear. Uh, bear. Okay? So he says, I do not want you to please men, but to please God. For I shall never again have such a chance to get to God. Such a chance. That is, this particular opportunity to die in this fashion. Nor can you, if you keep quiet, get credit for a finer deed. That is, if you don't try to 
get me off. The credit that will come to you for allowing me to become a martyr will be even greater than anything you could have had. For if you quietly let me alone, people will, what? See in me God's word. They'll see God's word lived out. Lived out how? By him becoming food for the lions? By him facing death without fear. By him facing death without fear. By him conquering death. Okay? Keep in mind, I mean, this is a... How do I put this? This is a pretty strange notion to the world at the time. This idea of overcoming death, of conquering death. And of overcoming and conquering death, how? By dying. By dying. Exactly. I mean, it, it flies in the face of all reason, right? But the wisdom of God is foolishness to men, as St. Paul says. So he says, if you are enamored of my mere body, I shall, on the contrary, be a meaningless noise. That is, if you stop my martyrdom for happening... I'll be a meaningless noise. He's telling his, his readers there, he won't shut up. He's not going to stop writing and preaching. But he says, I will be a meaningless noise. Why meaningless? Because if he doesn't follow through with what he says he's going to do, then people can't really, they, don't, they won't put as much stock in what he says. Exactly. And it, all, it will also be like what St. Paul talks about. If you, you know, can preach and you can prophesy and you can all do, do all these things and you have not love, you become what? There's a sounding gong. That's what he means. For him to have all love is to die for Christ. Okay? He says, if I don't, I will just be a resounding symbol or loud gong. So he goes on in... Just before chapter 3, um, he's telling the church, you can form yourselves into an altar and sing praises to the Father in Jesus Christ. Why? That God gave the bishop of Syria himself the privilege of reaching the sun's setting when he summoned him from its writing. Now notice that beautiful paradox and juxtaposition. He gave the bishop of Syria the privilege of reaching the sun setting, the sun setting on his life, when he summoned him from the rising. Okay? From the rising of the sun, like on the cross, it is a grand thing for my life to set on the world. Life to set, to end, to come to rest. And for me to be on my way to grow up. To, for me to be on my way to God. Why? So that I may rise in his presence. It's St. It's Paul's, you know, to be absent of the body is to be present with the Lord. To be absent of the Lord is to be present in the body. Okay? Now chapter 3. He goes on and says, um, I pray that I may have strength of soul and body so that I may not only talk about martyrdom, but really want it. Um... This talk I was giving last night was about C.S. Lewis and these two different forms of theology. And somebody asked us one question or made a comment about um, Lewis and his wife when his wife was ill and how Lewis did something that a close friend of his suggested all Christians can do, which is to bear the burdens of the other. And Charles Williams, this close friend of Lewis's, said that it's possible to literally do that. Not just, you know, oh, I'm sorry for you all, feel for you all, show, you know, compassion and all that kind of stuff. Williams believed that it was literally possible to pray to God to ask to take somebody else's suffering from them, okay? That's kind of what um, Ignatius is talking about here in terms of the really wanting it, okay? Lewis came to believe that that's really true. And so he prayed when his wife was on her deathbed, what they thought was her deathbed, God, take the pain from her. Give it to me. She had cancer in her legs. Welcome to total remission. 
completely gone. Doctors had no idea how. Okay, she lived three more years, got sick again, died quickly. All right, to really want it, it is not that I want merely to be called a Christian. It's it's not enough to just have the name, but to be one. And for Ignatius, to be one means what? To take on Christ's name. It's in Antioch, the church that he was bishop of, that Christians are first called Christians. Well, what does that mean? Followers of Christ. Well, how do you follow Christ? Take up your cross, deny yourself. Okay? He would find his life, must lose it for my sake. So he says, if I prove to be one, then I can have the name. That is, if I die, and notice that, that you know, supposition, if, I might not make it. I mean, I might chicken out. But if I do it, then I am worthy of the name. Okay? Nothing, I need to do the previous sentence. Then too, I shall be a convincing Christian only when the world sees me no more. What? What does he mean by that? Because he will be a Christian how? Unto death. That is, he will take the life, the teachings, the belief in Christ and apply it all the way to the end. I mean, that's why St. Paul says, you know, that if the resurrection is a sham, if the resurrection didn't occur, then Christians of all people are the most to be pitied because they believe in nothing, ultimately. Okay. So, nothing you can see has real value. No, dangerous, but you could say it. But that is an example. Gnostic teaching. Nothing you can see has real value. Everything, everything around you, it's just an emanation. Okay, and it's a dirty one at that. <laughs> It's foul, it's evil, all physical materiality, the Gnostics would teach, you know, is impure. And the idea is that we must get beyond this impurity. It's like when, should I use this conceit? No, one day. It's like when Yoda says, <laughs> talking about <coughs> the body, we are not this physical stuff, celestial beings. Beings of light, okay? That is this Gnostic idea. That's not what Ignatius means, however, okay? Because he doesn't just stop and say, nothing you can see has real value, end. No. Our God, Jesus Christ, indeed, has revealed himself more clearly by returning to the Father. Well, what does he mean, ultimately, by that? What happened to Christ after the crucifixion? The resurrection. Well, what did the resurrection entail? Was it merely a shadow? A ghost figure? What does Christ do? I mean, you know, the perfect two perfect examples to prove that he had a real body. When the disciples see him on the sea of on the edge of the, the shore of the Sea of Galilee, what's he doing? Frying fish. He doesn't eat the fish and they become like, you know, when uh Captain Barbosa in Pirates of the Caribbean drinks wine. It doesn't kind of just trickle down and they go, oh, cool, you know, nice special effects. What about when he sees Thomas? Does he show him? He says, put your finger through the hole in my hand. Feel it. Come on. Put, that tickles, you know. Feel the heart. Feel the lungs. I mean, he makes him physically touch. And what does Thomas say? My Lord and my God. Blessed are you because you believed, but even more blessed are those who don't see and yet believe. All right? Ignatius goes on. The greatness of Christianity. I just absolutely love this line. I posted it to Facebook last week. The greatness of Christianity lies in its being hated by the world, not in its being convincing to it. That flies in the face of almost everything about modern missiology, modern missions. This idea that, quote-unquote, Christians have got to go out and convince the world of the truth of the gospel. 
What St. Ignatius seems to be saying is, no. What does Christ say his followers will have? Hardship. They, they won't have it easy. So if one truly is a Christian, to follow the language of this, it means they will be hated by the world. It, it means they will be persecuted. It doesn't mean they're going to grow up following Christ perfectly and be extremely filthy rich and not have any problems whatsoever in life. Okay? So, I hate those things. And so he goes on and says, it's a movie next door. He goes on and says, let me be fodder for wild beasts. That is how I can get to God. <laughs> and it rooms like the door is all the way down there. That is how I can get to God. I am God's wheat, and I am being ground by the teeth of wild beasts to make a pure loaf for God. In other words, when he says, I am ground wheat and will be made into a pure loaf for God, what he means there is he will be the what in the Orthodox Church is called the prosphora, the offering. He'll be the communion bread, the Eucharistic bread for God. And there's a great, um, I'll email it to you, there's a great icon of St. Ignatius, and it's him standing, and there's a lion on one side standing on its hind legs with its mouth getting ready to chomp into it the side of its head. And then there's a lion on the other side with its feet, back legs up here, and its mouth getting ready to chomp into his feet. And the idea here is head to foot, he's gone. Okay, And that he will be ground into wheat that way. Um, and he goes on and says, I'd rather that you fawn on the beast so that they may be my tomb and no scrap of my body be left. Okay, it's not apparently what happened according to the martyrdom of St. Ignatius. Okay, going to chapter 5. So he says, even now as a prisoner, I am learning to forego my own wishes. Learning. He's on his way to Rome to be slaughtered. He hasn't yet mastered or controlled his own wishes. Boy, and I'm just seeing all kinds of parallels as I'm teaching with this, with Harry Potter. I'm going to have to bring these up in my class. And he talks about, you know, being chained to his leopards. And what happens? They get worse the better you treat them. The implication is he is trying to treat them well. And the more he treats them well, the worse they treat him. But by their injustices, I am becoming a better disciple. How? Because they're whipping him. They're beating him. They become kind of this, this physical... I don't want to say cleansing of his sins, but they, well, let me just say this, Lewis again. They kind of, if you're familiar with the Voyage of the Dawn Treader, they're kind of acting like the lion that undragons Eustace, that peels away these layers of rottenness. What they are teaching him is freedom. They're preparing that. Because what's going to happen when he meets the, the lions? He's not going to get thrown into the lions and, you know, the jailers are going to drug him. He's going to get thrown into the lions totally wide awake. And the lions aren't going to be fed for like a week beforehand to make them good and hungry so that they'll attack whatever. So now is the moment I am beginning to be a disciple. What does he mean by that? Existentially understanding it. It's not just words or a creed. It is very intimate uh, understanding. I like that first word. Existential. Existentially. Because what it's, what's meant by that? Acting outside himself. Beyond words. Yeah. It's, it's, it's moment by moment. Yeah. It's every moment for him is a means to deny itself. Every moment, every step he takes closer to Rome, he is becoming 
a disciple. Notice he doesn't say, I am a disciple. I am beginning to be a disciple. So that means every decision, it's a first step. Even though he's taken thousands of steps. You know, he was bishop of Antioch, for Pete's sake. Sure, for Ignatius' sake, I should say. Okay. He was bishop of Antioch. You should say that, you know, he was already a disciple. <coughs> well, but when he was bishop of Antioch, he hadn't yet been tested or tried. Now he's being tested and tried daily. Come fire, cross, battling with wild beasts, wrenching of bones, mangling of limbs, crushing of my whole body, cruel tortures of the devil. Only let me get to Jesus Christ. No matter what happens, he's saying. Let me what? Get to Jesus Christ. How? By being faithful. Not the wide bounds of earth nor the kingdoms of this world will avail me anything. There are no riches, in other words. There is nothing on this earth that will help me get to Jesus Christ. That's why he says, I would rather die and get to Jesus Christ than reel over the ends of the earth. Okay? And then this is just another mind-blowing line. I am going through the pangs of being born. How so? How is this labor pains? Not the mother's labor pains, the child's labor pains. You know, from everything we know, birth is not a pleasant experience for the child, just as it's not for the mother, okay? Because it goes from this nice, warm, cozy place to out here. <laughs> where it's cold, and it's not warm and cozy, and, you know, feeding is different, and all that stuff, all right? How is this the pangs of being born? He's equating the earth, you know, to this earth, essentially, with, you know, birth into, you know, heaven. Right. So he's, he's essentially being born again. Um, this is not all that there is. I mean, when he said earlier, uh, nothing you can see has real value. What he means is, this is the, the proto-life. This is the, the before life. We need the real life. This is, to use C.S. Lewis's terms, this is the Shadowlands. And we only get to the real lands, how? If you're familiar with Chronicles of Narnia, death. It, the only way Peter, Edmund, and Lucy get to the real Narnia is through the train crash at the train station. Okay? The only way to get to the real Narnia, the real God, the real Christ, is through death. I'm going through the pangs of being born. Notice what he doesn't say. He just totally gave away the twist ending on the cross, right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but what else? Notice he doesn't say it's easy. He doesn't say, have faith, just believe. Yeah, they're going to slaughter you, they're going to rip you limb from limb, but it's okay, Jesus will make you feel good. He doesn't do that. He says, no, there will be pain, there will be suffering, there will be agony. But... The result will be positive. So sympathize with me, my brothers. Do not stand in the way of my coming to life. Because if they stand in the way, what happens to him? He's aborted. And he doesn't get to God. Let me get into the clear light, and manhood will be mine. The clear light. Well, if the light after death is clear, then what does that say about light here? It's St. Paul's 1 Corinthians 13. Now we see through a glass darkly. And all of our vision is murky. We don't see clearly. But then he says, I will be in the clear light, and what? Then I'll be a real man. A manly man, you know, the kind of man that Lewis talks about in The Abolition of Man. A man with a chest. A man who has real feelings, real thought, and it's not sexist because he means a real human. I think what St. Ignatius 
is, is really getting at is none of us are yet what we are meant to be. We are all in the process of becoming. Okay? The, the Orthodox Church, keep in mind he's a father in the Orthodox Church, the Orthodox Church says that when the book of Genesis talks about being made in the image and likeness of God, these are two different things. It's not the image, parentheses, likeness. Okay? What many of the fathers say is that what that means there, image and likeness of God, is that we're made in the image of God. Okay? The likeness is what we develop into. St. Peter... Um, 2 Peter 2, 13, something like that, you know, that we shall be partakers of God. It's this process of what's called theos deification, divinization, all right? Let me get into the clear light. Manhood will be mine. Let me imitate the passion of my God. If anyone has him in him, that is, if anyone has God in him, let him appreciate what I'm longing for and sympathize with me. All right? Go down to the next chapter, a couple lines in. Do not talk Jesus Christ and set your heart on the world. Don't spout one thing and then set your heart on the pleasures of this place. For though alive, it is, skipping another couple lines, for though alive, it is with a passion for death that I'm writing to you. My desire has been crucified and there burns in me no passion for material things. My desire, now there's a note there and it's a pun, because he's talking about Christ. Christ is his desire. And that's been crucified. But it's not only Christ. It's also his desire. His desires have been crucified. And that's why there burn in me no passion, no desire for material things. Okay? What the early fathers referred to as apatheia. Lack of passion. It doesn't mean apathetic. Two very, very different ideas. Okay? Um, any questions about the letter to the Romans that I haven't addressed? None? Who's Crocus? Pardon? I don't know. I just saw a name. Yeah, there, is, there are several. Oh, uh, at the end, mm -hmm. in his, uh, not benediction, his closing. Uh, I don't know who Crocus is. Just a person that is with him. Lady says that is very dear to me. Okay? And again, notice, just before that ending, as he finishes all of his letters, what does he say? Remember the church in Antioch. Why? Because it has suffered particularly bad. Okay, keep in mind, the reason... Ignatius is on his way to Rome. He angered Trajan. Okay. So, the letter to the Philadelphians. Um, and with the first chapter. And he starts to talk about the bishop. If you remember the information I had on the board the other day, these three main themes. Okay. Um, one, church unity or order or hierarchy. Two, his impending martyrdom. Okay. And three, staying away from schism or divisions in the church. All right. So that first chapter there, he's talking about the bishop, the local bishop of the Philadelphians. Um, and then he goes on and just jumps right into fleeing schism. Flee from schism. Where the shepherd is, there follow like there follow like sheep. That is, where the shepherd is, the sheep that are like the shepherd. So if somebody comes in bringing a doctrine, a teaching, an idea different than the shepherd, like sheep. They are different sheep. Okay? So he says, in the face of your unity, they, that is, people who bring in strange, will not have a chance. 
keep away from bad pasturage. Well, what's bad pasturage? Bad food. Bad. Okay. As many as are, skipping up the lines, as many as are gods and Jesus Christ's, they are on the bishop's side. And there's that equality of the bishop with God the Father. And as many as repent and enter the unity of the church, they shall be gods, and thus they shall live in Jesus Christ's way. I continually have this idea of the authority of the bishop. Now, Richardson, as I said the other day, you know, says in his notes that there's nothing in Ignatius about apostolic succession per se. But it seems to me the very fact that he's hit the bishop again and again and again, he is talking about apostolic succession, succession not secession, completely different. Let's <laughs> that's, that's get into Mormonism. Yeah. <laughs> My brain is about, has about this much, one bar out of the, um, so it goes on. As, uh, go on to chapter 4. Be careful then to observe a single Eucharist. Why? Because there is one flesh of our Lord Jesus Christ and one cup of his blood that makes us one altar. Okay? Just as there is one bishop along with the presbytery and the deacons. This emphasis on unity again and again. And when he's talking about a single Eucharist, he's saying, where's the bishop? Because that's where the Eucharist is. The Eucharist celebrated away from the bishop. All right? Um, he goes on and talks about his love for them. He talks about people preaching Judaism to them. I'm going to skip most of that. Go into chapter 6. And in the middle of that chapter where he says... Flee, the wicked trick, flee then, the wicked tricks and snares of the prince of this world, lest the Christians wear you down, and you waver in your love. Well, what kind of wicked tricks and snares? Doubts, temptations, difficulties. Rather, meet together all of you, heart, single heart. That is one in purpose. Okay? I'm going to keep referring to Lewis um, just because he's so good. If you've read screw tape letters, um, in the screw tape letters, one of the things, screw tape letters is a series of letters written by a senior demon to a junior demon. And the junior demon has his first patient, his first person he gets to tempt and try to bring down to our father below in the infernal regions. And the patient becomes a Christian. And screw tape, it's not the end of the world. We can work with this because, you know, we have a lot down below who are Christians. And one of the things he says is, okay, he's going to church. That's fine. Now, get him to concentrate in church, not on what's happening in church. Get him to concentrate instead on what the person in the pew in front of him is doing, or what the person in the pew beside him is doing, uh, or on the person behind him who can't sing, and what that does to his whole notion of beauty and liturgy and meaning. And, okay, if heaven's going to be full of all these people that I really don't like, fat people, ugly people, skinny people, tall people, short people, out-of-tune people, etc., okay, What's it do? It takes his mind off of Christian charity. It takes his mind off of the unity of the faith and puts him in the position of the driver's seat. So that what is he doing as he's sitting there praying to God? He's judging and condemning everybody around him. Okay? So, meet together all of you with a single hurt. Have a same common purpose. Um, in our church, you know, one of the most common things you'll hear is in peace, let us pray. And that doesn't mean peace from the outside world. It does mean that partially, but it means in peace, 
all of us together in concord, in harmony, let us pray to the Lord. Why? Because where two or three are gathered in my name, bingo. Okay. Um, chapter 7. Right about in the middle. Yeah, take it back. It's only two or three sentences in. St. Ignatius says, When I was with you, I cried out, raising my voice. It was God's voice. <sighs> Look at what he says there. I cried out. It was God's voice. God was speaking. He says through him. Okay? He's called a prophet at times. This is an act of prophecy. Pay heed to the bishop, the presbytery, and the deacons. Notice he's saying, that wasn't me. That was God talking. All right? Do nothing apart, skipping a few lines, do nothing apart from the bishop. Keep your bodies as if they were God's temple. Value, un little short aphorisms. Just like we saw in the Didache. You know, the first half of the Didache, the way of life. Do this, 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 and this. Value unity, flee schism, imitate Jesus Christ as he imitated his father. In other words, go out and buy your little WWJD bracelets and what would Jesus do? Why? Because his, he wore his WWGD. What would God do? And that's what I'm doing. You know? What does Christ say? I do only what I have seen the father do. I speak only what the father has given me to speak. So, I then, beginning chapter 8, I think this is the last comment about this one. I then was doing all I could as what? A man utterly devoted to unity. Okay, this is what? The fourth letter? Fifth letter? Why the emphasis on unity? Why does he keep hammering? Exactly. Church. Uh -huh. Because there are false teachers. There is schism raising its head. And he, he is trying to drill into them. You cannot be the church if you are divided. Why? What's the quote-unquote proof text against that? What's Christ's final prayer? He prays to God that they will know. Let me rephrase that. He prays to God that they will be one, as thou and I are one, and that they will love one another with the love with which you have loved me and the love with which I have loved them. Well, what's the love with which he has loved them? He dies for them. Okay? So how are they to... Be one and love one another. To, to, be willing to, die. to be willing to die for one another. To be willing, take the back, not to be willing, to place their desires beside and somebody else's desires ahead of theirs. Somebody else's desires, somebody else's wants, somebody else's needs before theirs. That, that is all included in that praying for unity. That's why the early church, you know, we're told in the book of Acts, you know, the early church held everything in common. It wasn't because communists. It was because they denied themselves. And they looked at themselves as an organism with one head, Christ. And as a single organism, each individual member was what? A part of the body. So you had fingers and fingernails and toes and knees and elbows and hips and buttocks and shoulders and chest and hair and ears. And each one was necessary. Each one was not more important than another, however. Okay. Where there is schism and bad feeling, God has no place. I, I, I won't assume to speak for you, but man, that's hard. Where there is... Not the schism part, but bad feeling? Harboring some kind of ill will against someone? Okay. That's why Christ says, you know, when you go to offer your sacrifice, do what? 
make sure your brother doesn't have a problem with what you're doing. And make sure you don't have a problem with your brother. Because if you do, stop. <laughs> don't offer the sacrifice. Because what kind of value and meaning will that sacrifice have? Zip. Nothing. The Lord forgives all who repent. If that is, their repentance brings them into God's unity and to the bishop's counsel. In other words, you can't repent and still not hold on to what the bishop says. You can't repent most of the way. Okay? I put my confidence in the grace of Jesus Christ who will release you from all your chains. Okay, I want to stop there. Any questions about the Philadelphians? All right. The Smyrnians. Introduction here talks about it's at Smyrna that... Um, pardon? Just a few miles away from here. Yeah, different Smyrna. I'm thinking of the Smyrna in, in uh, Florida, New Smyrna Beach. Because I lived in Orlando for a couple of years. You ever you know, wonder why so many places in the South have these weird Middle Eastern and North African names? You know, Carth Sparta. Carthage, Sparta, Athens. Antioch. Antioch, Antioch yeah. <laughs> Lebanon. <laughs> I, I never, in, in Nashville, you know, like a lot of the architecture, like everything is named after Greek stuff. I it's because Nashville is called the Athens of the South. Yeah, see, I don't know why, though. The Parthenon. Yeah. yeah I so understand. Like I got, but, but, like, right. obviously, but, I mean, there was, there was some... There was something that preceded that, though, where mm -hmm. someone decided we were going to make this all Greek. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, <laughs> Lebanon and Antioch, I mean, there were, in the early days, there were Lebanese and Turkish um, immigrants. Hmm. I can't answer, you know, I don't know that Carthaginians founded Carthage. I don't, <laughs> don't really think so. <laughs> or Athenians, you know, came along with... <clears throat> That'd be a really weird... Aeneas to start, you know, <laughs> Athens. This big, this big, you know, giant exodus of, you know, people from... North Africa. <laughs> North Africa. We shall... Memphis. Now, we shall be in music city. Now, in, in, <laughs> in Florida, I can say, it is because there was a Greek community um, in St. Augustine. You know, you, you go to St. Augustine today, and there is in one of the oldest... Uh, buildings down there, there is a shrine to an 8th century um, what's it? 8th century patriarch, St. Photius the Great. And it's, I mean, it's just beautiful. It's like a little hole in the wall, literally. You go in and you go, oh, wow, neat. You go in and there's beautiful icons and all this kind of stuff. And it's because of the early Greek heritage in St. Augustine and then, you know, Go a few miles on down the beach, and you go to New Smyrna Beach, and you know things like that. Okay, so the letter to the Smyrnians. Um, he came into contact with the Docetist heresy, and the Docetist heresy essentially said that when Christ hung on the cross, it wasn't a real body. He he wasn't really real. It was a an apparition. Why? Because it is impossible for God to suffer like that. Impossible how? Rationally. According to, to Greek logic, this doesn't compute. This doesn't make any sense. Well, that's why the incarnation doesn't fit Greek logic. That's why the wisdom of God is foolishness to men, and the cross is a stumbling block to the Greeks. Now, when you, said, when you say, like, according to Greek logic, obviously Greeks had a lot of suffering gods. You know, and you know, but not. I mean, obviously not a monotheistic type God, but I mean, like, you know, why? Why would that be a particular stumbling block for Greeks? Wouldn't that be more of a stumbling block for Jews? Well, because the Greeks, the Greek gods weren't human, right? <clears throat> and that's the whole basis of Christ is that He is God who entered human experience. Apollo an entered human experience. Alex? Also, they're, they're, they're gods. They're not talking about what Aristotle called the unmoved mover. Exactly. They're talking right. about gods which are originate, not unoriginate. Yeah. They're talking about gods that in, in, in the origins of, of the cosmos and various formations of that in, in mythological writing, 
were not at one time. Exactly. So I mean, but did they did they associate like the Christian, the you know Aristotelian? Yeah, they or? so yeah they associated this monotheistic God with the the prime mover. Okay. Okay. That's impossible. Right. Because you know passionless, right. etc. And right. here you know, and this is what makes Christianity, as Saint Paul says, a stumbling block. Because they can't wrap their heads. Well, nobody can. I mean, when you think about it, you can't think about it. This is what I was part of what I was talking about last night in terms of what's called apophatic theology, which means negative theology. Think about it for a moment. How easy is it to understand the incarnation? God, the being above all being, the existence above all existence, the the totally other becomes an embryo in a womb, is born, has to have diapers changed, has to have nails clipped, has to have nose wiped, has to have knees, you know, bandaged after being scraped. It's how can that happen? Well, we can never know how that can happen. It's, it's not something to be rationally understood. And the fathers of the church never try to rationally understand it. In the ecumenical councils, they never say, oh, this is how it all happened out. You know, you start off with, and they come up with the logic. They don't. They use one word to describe that and everything else that is key. It's a mystery. In fact, in the, in the Greek church, or the Orthodox church, they don't even call the sacraments sacraments. They're called the mysteries. Because they cannot be fully understood. You know, how baptism, quote-unquote, works. It's a mystery. Or the mystery of marriage, the mystery of ordination, the mystery of last rites, etc. Okay, the mystery of penance and confession and such. So, the docetist heresy said, he couldn't have been real, because God can't suffer like that. Okay? And so, Ignatius wants to argue against that. And I want to pick up with chapter 1, a couple sentences in, where he writes, regarding our Lord, you are absolutely convinced. Notice he says, you are absolutely convinced. He's not saying, I want to convince you. You already know this, but let me just reiterate it to put the icing on the cake and make sure everybody's clear. Then on the human side, he was actually sprung from David's line. Goes all the way back, not through Joseph, through Mary, though Joseph was also descended from David. Son of God, according to God's will and power. So, on the human side, he came from David. <clears throat> on the non-human side, he came from God. Okay, According to God's will and power. Notice, not according to some begottenness genealogy. He was son of God because God said son of God. Okay? actually born of a virgin, baptized by John, that all righteousness might be fulfilled in him, and actually crucified for us in the flesh under Pontius Pilate and Herod the Tetrarch. Why do we hear whenever Christ is referred to as being crucified, or almost always, you know, especially in the Gospels, you know, Herod's name, Pilate's name, you know, when he's born, Quirinius was governor of Syria. Because that's to establish that it wasn't actual historical Historical event. markers, uh, exactly. These aren't, this isn't some sort of Myth. This isn't in a galaxy a long time ago, far, far away, kind of a thing, or once upon a time. Yeah. Eternally recurring. Exactly. Yeah, it's not like... Um, it's not a cyclical uh, thing. Yeah, it's not like this it. isn't, you know, the vegetation god who dies and comes back and dies and comes back and dies and comes back. All right? Thus, by his resurrection, he raised a standard. you got to love this martial language, you know. You get this image of Christ coming out of the grave, and he's got this big flag, and follow me, man, you know. Raised a standard to rally his saints and faithful forever. Okay. Um, that's the right place. Whether Jews or Gentiles, in one body of his church, there's the unity. One body. For it was for our sakes that he suffered all this. Why? To save us. And he genuinely suffered. As even he genuinely raised himself. 
How do we know he genuinely suffered? Well, look at the words of the New Testament. He suffered even before the cross, right? Garden of Gethsemane. What does he do? Tears of blood. <laughs> yeah, Christ, tears of blood. And, Father, if it be possible, take this cup. He didn't want to die, and he didn't want to die that kind of death. That's a horrible way to die, all right? But, not my will, but thine be done. And then on the cross, does he just hang there and go, la, 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 taking upon the Savior, you know, sins of the world, not a problem because I'm God, and I don't feel any pain. No. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And that's pain. Because who is saying that? Christ. Okay? The human Christ is saying, Dad, where are you? And he genuinely suffered as even he genuinely himself. It is not as some unbelievers say that his passion was a sham. It's they who are a sham. Genius on the part of Ignatius. They will be the ones proven to be a mere illusion. Why? Because they won't last. This fate will fit their fancies. They will be ghosts and apparitions. But true believers will what? Real bodies. Not imaginary bodies. Not phony bodies. Okay? So he goes on and says, for me, I'm convinced. I don't need any proof. After all, what did Christ say? Take hold of me. Touch me. See that I am not a bodiless ghost. And they at once touched him and were convinced, clutching his body and his very breath. For this reason, they despised death itself and proved its victors. He'd done something nobody had done before. And he'd done something that a few people did before. They did. All right. Um, Elijah. Okay. But he not only raises the other dead, Lazarus, the widow of, of Nain's son, Jairus' daughter and such, himself. It's not like, you know, he punches some timer in his body and, you know, 36 hours later. Self-rising. Yeah, self-rising son of God flower, you know, or something like that. <laughs> burn. <laughs> so for this reason, they despised death itself and proved its victors. Why? Death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Death could no longer contain them. This is why, Harry Potter plug, this is why Albus Dumbledore the next great adventure at the end of the first novel. Death is not something to be feared. Moreover, after the resurrection, he ate and drank with them as a real human being, although in spirit he was united with the Father. Now, when he says as a real human being, does that mean his body was just like ours? No, it was a glorified body. How do we know? Because he could come and go and locked doors <laughs> without them seeing the door open. Anybody, get up, try. <laughs> <laughs> It's kind of hard, all right? See, little did we know about Jesus' ninja training. <laughs> yeah, it's... <clears throat> don't get Alex started that was, on... That was what was don't get on. Alex started on ninja, you know, Buddhism. And, that was what was going on, the, the, that, those missing years, right? He was learning to those missing that. years between <laughs> the ages of 12 and 30. As some people say, he was off in India. <laughs> He was studying under the master. Because, of course, travel was, was really, you know, cheap. Well, it wasn't cheap, but it was fairly easy with the Silk Road and everything. I mean, it, they had a pretty straight shot, but still, it would take a while. <laughs> it was that you found in one of the, the Viking hordes. Really? So, in yeah. Sweden, yeah. <laughs> um, go on to chapter 6. Pay close attention, this is the second paragraph, I think it's the second paragraph. Pay close attention to those who have wrong notions about the grace of Jesus Christ, which has come to us, and note, note how at variance they are with God's mind. They care nothing about love. They have no concern for widows, or orphans, 
for the oppressed, for those in prison or released, for the hungry or the thirsty. Now, what is he talking about? Look at that passage again. Pay close, and, and, and did, boy, this just hit me like a frying pan over the head. Wow. Pay close attention to those who have wrong notions about the grace of Jesus Christ, which has come to us, and know it, how, note how at variance they are with God's mind. Now, what kind of wrong notions could he be talking about? Well, about the grace of Christ. He's talking about, he's still talking about Dostism right now. He, he, he's still, he's still talking, because they don't believe that he had a body. They believe that, you know, the physical world is material. So obviously they <coughs> wouldn't bother with the widows and the orphans because their okay. suffering is physical and thus pointless. You, you know, it's not, is that what, am I... I, I think that could be right. Okay. I'm not saying it's it's wrong. I don't know that it is what he means. What's another possibility? Uh, their actions reveal them to not be Christian. They don't behave. Cheap grace. Yeah, they don't behave as if they believe it, I guess. Yeah. I mean, for any of you who know, why did Martin Luther hate, hate the book of James? Anybody know? What's the book of James about? A lot of it is, uh, um, a lot of it deals with um, the, uh, the, yeah. the, it has the, the phrase, you know, you say you believe, you know, good for you, so do the demons, you know, and all that stuff. Um, theology of works. Theology of works. If you say you have Jesus Christ and you do not feed the hungry, clothe the poor, da 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 da, then you have not Christ. Okay? And what James is doing there is he's not saying grace is irrelevant. He's saying if you have grace, then guess what? You will take care of the poor and all these others. If you don't take care of the poor and all the others, then that means you have not received grace. It is not a diabolical, uh, diametrically opposed, and diabolical, you know, <laughs> distinction between faith and works. It is faith and works. This comes first. This comes second. Without this, there is none of this. There is no faith without works. But works always presupposes the prior existence of faith and grace. Okay? Alec, what do you it, it completely blows the false dichotomy of sola fide yeah. out of the water. Yeah. Faith alone. The Latin for faith alone. So, taking that in mind, pay close attention to those who have wrong notions about the grace of Jesus Christ, which has come to us. And know what variants they are with God's mind. Because how at variance are they? What do they not do? They don't care for the oppressed. They have no concern for widows or orphans. They don't visit those in prison or the released. They don't care for the hungry or the thirsty. They hold aloof from the Eucharist and from services of prayer because they refuse to admit that the Eucharist is the flesh of our Savior Jesus Christ. Okay? Notice what he's just said. It's the flesh of our Savior. It's not a remembrance. It's not a mere memorial. This is St. Ignatius saying this, okay? Which, that is Christ, suffered for our sins, and which, in his goodness, the Father raised from the dead. So his belief, written in 110 AD, is that when Christ says, this is my body, broken for you, this is my blood, shed for you, he means it literally, okay? But those who have wrong notions about grace... Don't, and they don't pay any attention to it, okay? Now, skip to, what time is it, 10, 11? Chapter 8, we've got, what, one more letter? Yeah. Um, chapter 8, flee from schism as the source of mischief. You should all follow the bishop as Jesus Christ did the Father. Because keep in mind earlier, who did he pair the bishop to? God the Father. He paired the presbytery with the Council of Apostles, and he paired the deacons with Christ himself. Follow to, notice how little, by the way, 
St. Ignatius talks about the Holy Spirit. Have we seen him refer much to the Holy Spirit? No. I think there's only one or two phrases so far. Okay? Why? Because the Spirit doesn't become a intention until about two to three hundred years later. Okay? Two to two hundred and eighty years later. Um, you should all follow the bishop as Christ did the Father, follow to the presbytery as you would the apostles, respect the deacons as you would God's law. So you have the church hierarchy there. Yeah. So the point of contention, though, that you're talking about, happened like, like About the spirit? Yeah. Could you give it brief, like, what that point of contention was? Uh, was it the procession of the spirit from the Father? And so? was the, that comes much later. I thought that was... <laughs> that comes much later because of the council and spirit, what's called the filioque. Um... Now, we'll talk about that part later. Um, we'll save talking about the Holy Spirit until we get to St. Basil. Because even though we're not reading on the Holy Spirit, I'll bring it up then. Because it was St. Basil who really defended the divinity of the Holy Spirit and said, equal in the Trinity, equal to the Father, equal to the Son, same essence, homoousia, the whole nine yards, etc. Um do anything that has to do with the church without the bishop's approval. You should regard the Eucharist as valid, which is celebrated either by the bishop, what? Or by someone he authorizes. That's succession. Okay? It's not necessarily succession in the sense of the bishop laying hands on another person to be bishop. It is succession in that the bishop has the authority to authorize that person. Well, who becomes that person within about a period of 200 years? The priest. And it becomes where you have local churches, not where there is a bishop at every church, but you have a priest. And the priest can celebrate, perform the mysteries. Why? Because a bishop has anointed that individual. Okay? Uh, where the bishop is present, let the congregation be just as where Christ is. There is the, and this is the first use of this term, the Catholic Church. R.C. Catholic Church, Catholic, the universal church. Okay, now what does that mean? Where, just as where Christ is, there is the Catholic Church. What he means is, say, this is the church in Smyrna, this is the church at Philadelphia, this is the church at Magnesia. Where you have the Catholic Church. That is, yes, this is a local body. This is also the entire church. This is a local body. This is the entire church. Why? Because they, these are all connected. How? One head. One head, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one you know, remission of sin, the whole nine yards. Without the bishop's supervision, no baptisms or love feasts are permitted. Love feast, that's the Eucharist, because the communion meal. Um, I don't want to say the, okay, any questions about that letter, or any comments about that letter? So, the, when, when he says, because they refuse to admit that the Eucharist is the flesh for our Savior Jesus Christ, he's talking about transubstantiation. Um, Where are you? Or, uh, back in chapter 7. Uh, no. Transubstantiation is an idea and a term that comes around about a thousand years at least later. Right. What he's talking about is what I'm going to use later Protestant term. What a later Protestant will call the real presence mm -hmm. of Christ. In the elements that are used for the Eucharist, okay? Um, what Ignatius and none of the fathers do is they never define what that means, the flesh of our Savior Jesus Christ in the Eucharist. This is what the scholastic church does do, and that's why they come up with the term transubstantiation. What is that? It's a scientific term. It's to describe how across substances change. 
Okay, substance essence of something. How you can change from the essence of water, salt, flour, and wheat, or water, salt, flour, and, and yeast, to flesh. How does that happen? Uh, transubstantiation. That's how. It's not a physical, it's not a chemical formula. It's a term, however, to describe what? The mystery. Whereas Ignatius and the early fathers all say it's a mystery. Don't try to understand. In any case, he is, he is seeing that as a literal. This yes. Body. Yes. Which I always found a bit odd considering that when Jesus actually said that, obviously his body was there holding the bread. Um, so yeah. obviously that was his body. Yeah. So in that instance, what was the bread? <laughs> Well, but what does he do? I mean, yes, you could say, oh, well, it's just symbol. It's, it's just symbolism. This is my body. Okay. And yes, he was physically there holding it, but he wasn't physically there much longer. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Do this in remembrance of me, for whenever you do, you celebrate, you know, my coming and all that kind of stuff. So you can take that as... Just being symbol, in which case, how valid are symbols? What, do, what power do all symbols have? Whatever power you give to them. Sure. Okay, what else? They point to something. Yeah, they point right. beyond themselves. They point to something beyond themselves. They point to a deeper reality. Right. Okay, so even if you look at it that way, I think you could still say, hmm. It's pointing to a deeper reality. What's the deeper reality? The deeper reality is not bread and wine. Okay, the deeper reality is something else. Okay, so that when Christ does say, "This is my body," this is or this is my body shed for you. This is my blood. Okay, what's the deeper reality? He's talking about himself. Okay. Um, I was just reading the other day. St. Paul's talking about food. And he essentially says, uh, in, God, I can't remember where, says, you know, food is bad for him who thinks it's bad. Well, what's the deeper reality of that? Food is not inherently bad. Ham is not in inherently bad. Well, I mean, most are Muslim. Jewish. <laughs> but it's not inherently bad. But if you think it is, then it is bad for you. Right. Okay. If it acts, it's actual. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think, I mean, that's partly what he's getting at. But I do think he is saying those who deny the physical reality of Christ's flesh in the Eucharist are, uh, how did he put it? at variance with God's mind. Okay. Uh, okay. Letter to Polycarp. Five minutes left. <laughs> Let's do it this way. What, yeah. what questions do you have, if any, about the letter of Polycarp? And if you don't, we'll be done quick. <laughs> Does he say anything important in this letter? Um... <laughs> Well, he hits that old, you know, bugaboo unity again. He does add something a little bit different in chapter 1. Devote yourself to continual prayer. St. Paul says pray without ceasing. This is the first time we've seen this idea in St. Ignatius. Continual prayer. Take, and I love this because it's what I don't do nearly enough. Take a personal interest in those you talk to. Just us. Let that perk down for a little bit and think about <laughs> that. Right. How often do we get into conversations slash arguments where we're trying to win the argument so we don't really care what the other person thinks or says? Because while they're speaking, we're marshalling, you know, yeah. our rhetorical device and ready to blast them with our, you know. <laughs> yeah. Take a personal interest. How? Just as God does. 
I don't like that. I, <laughs> what does that mean? Suspending judgment entirely. Suspending judgment entirely and looking at them from God's perspective. I died for that person. It's a lot easier to not like people. <laughs> okay? And then this one, you know, it's really hard for me. It is no credit to you if you are fond of good pupils. I like good pupils. <laughs> It's the bad, lazy ones I don't really like, and I kind of feel, you know, they deserve the D's and F's they get. Rather, by your gentleness, subdue those who are annoying. Something tells me he was never a teacher. <laughs> Not every wound is healed by the same plaster. That's a fantastic line. Not every wound is healed by the same plaster. In other words... I can't address each individual in here in the exact same way. This isn't an assembly line. How different is it from an assembly line? Each of you are radically different. And this is why, you know, I said that thing the other day about um, when bin Laden was killed. You know, what, what so disgusted me about all the celebrations is as bad and evil as Osama bin Laden was, and Hitler and Stalin, etc., if one is a Christian, and I don't know if any of you are, but if one is a Christian and one accepts what the, the Bible, for example, or the church tradition says, then what does that mean? It means even they were created in the image and likeness of God. Damaged image? Sure. Dirtied image? Sure. Obliterated image? No. So what does it mean to be in the image of likeness of God? It means of all, that all the people that have ever lived, each one has exemplified, demonstrated some little aspect, some little character of God that nobody else does. And so when you remove that person, what happens? A little understanding or knowledge of God disappears. Now, that should be mind-blowing. And this is why I, I wrestle with capital punishment. You know, five years ago, blow them all the bits. You know, fry them, put them on the, here, I'll flip the switch kind of a thing. You know, for rapists, murderers, etc. And the longer I live, the more and more I'm becoming like Gandalf. Thinking, you know, maybe even the most horrible, rotten, foul, blech, person can be cured before their end. And shouldn't that be the goal? Shouldn't that be the goal? Shouldn't we want everybody to find their cure? Kind of an idea. Okay. Anything else? Okay, we'll stop there.